The MIT Enterprise Forum Texas and the Texas Young Professionals present Visionaries of Social Entrepreneurship. This program is generously underwritten by NRG. There's a lot of complex challenges out there in the world um, and um, social entrepreneurs often bring both a certain energy and passion to those social problems um, and an entrepreneurial way of thinking um, that, that you don't necessarily get uh, in the public sector, for example. Um, so they're, they're often challenging the status quo and they're saying, you know, what is broken about the world or what is particularly broken about my field um, and what can I do to change that in a fundamental way. Um, so that kind of boldness um, and that passion and that creativity, when you apply it to a social problem, it's usually a, a winning formula. You know, it's very American. I mean, this is a country of, of starting new things and new ideas and being bold. Um, and so I think people are attracted to applying that same uh, sort of pioneering spirit to social problems. So I've been asked to uh, briefly introduce social entrepreneurship uh, tonight, which is which I'm looking forward to doing. Um, uh, and I, I like to start uh, with a face because social entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurship is really about people. Uh, and the extraordinary work that they're doing around the world. So I wanted to show uh, this great photo of Bart Weechens, who is a social entrepreneur and, and happens to be an Ashoka Fellow, and he's here with uh, one of his giant African pouched rats. <laughs> uh, and, and what Bart does uh, is he trains these rats, uh, which have an acute sense of smell, uh, to detect landmines uh, left over after decades of conflict uh, in East Africa. Uh, the rats are smaller than dogs, so they're less likely to set off the mines. Uh, they also, more importantly, are local, so they're, they're uh, a native species, and they're less likely to be susceptible to uh, diseases. And of course, they're much less expensive than electronic equipment. Um, so Bard and his team have cleared millions of square meters uh, of, of land's worth of mines, and now they're actually training these rats uh, to be low-cost uh, early stages tuberculosis detectors, um, and tuberculosis is still one of the most deadly infectious diseases around the world. So, uh, so he's just one social entrepreneur of thousands that are taking on uh, complicated and difficult uh, challenges. Um, he happens to be an Ashoka Fellow, and of course we'll hear from several others uh, today. So what is a social entrepreneur? Um, you know, with most large-scale societal change, uh, there's often a person at the beginning uh, without whom that change would not have happened. Uh, that's what we call a social entrepreneur. Uh, these are people who make it uh, their life's mission to solve a particular social problem. Um, and, uh, and, and social entrepreneurs, um, in, solving those, uh, in, in solving those problems, they rely on a set of characteristics that we often associate with business entrepreneurs, right? So these are people who have innovative ideas. Um, they're deeply creative. Uh, they see their field five years ahead of everybody else. Uh, they have that tenacity and that passion, uh, but they're simply applying uh, those traits to a particular entrenched social problem. Now, when Ashoka uh, considers social entrepreneurs uh, for fellows, we look at five criteria, but really it boils down to two fundamental questions. The first is, is this a new or better way of solving a particular social problem? Uh, and the second is, is this person together with this idea potentially transformative? So we're looking for people who really challenge the status quo uh, and who are trying to push their fields in completely new directions. They're not just running programs. They're going at the heart of a problem and they're asking, what is keeping the world this way? Um, in business, you often hear of disruptive innovation, right? So these are, these are ideas like the assembly line or Wikipedia. These are the big ideas that really have ripple effects across industries. It doesn't really matter what kind of organization social entrepreneurs lead. They'll, they'll, they'll choose what makes the most sense for them to be successful. Uh, in this sense, they're both visionaries, but they're also deeply practical. They're highly attentive to the nuts and bolts of making things work, uh, and they'll build and plan accordingly. And finally, social entrepreneurs are deeply ethical and they're highly empathetic. And, and they're empathetic in the obvious sense of their motivation to help others and, and improve the human condition. Uh, but they also, you know, they apply empathy beautifully as problem solvers. Uh, and what this means is they go about trying to solve a problem first by asking questions and by listening. Uh, in this way, they're, they're very humble. Uh, and as they craft their solutions, they create roles for others uh, as part of those solutions, to own those solutions, which is essential for community buy-in and for sustainability. And it may not sound like rocket science, but you'd be amazed at how many initiatives uh, and development projects miss this step. 
So the field has come a long way over the last 30 years. Um, you know, Ashoka was founded about the time of the first personal computer in the early 80s. Uh, and back then, no one had heard the term social entrepreneur. It didn't mean these people didn't exist, uh, but they didn't have an identity. And more importantly, they didn't have a support system. Most were working day jobs, and they were trying to change the world uh, you know, during their evenings and weekends. Um, and meanwhile, if you were a business entrepreneur, there was this whole ecosystem of support around to help good ideas thrive. Right? There were venture capitalists. There were angel investors. There were professional networks of all kinds, you name it. Um, but if you were a social entrepreneur, you were basically on your own. So when Bill Drayton founded Ashoka uh, in the early 80s, he was guided by two central insights. Uh, the first is that business doesn't have a monopoly on entrepreneurship. And the second is that these social entrepreneurs represented a kind of trapped energy that needed the same kind of ecosystem of support to be released into the world. Uh, and so that's what he set out to do. And as I said, we've come a long way. Now we're sort of awash in buzzwords and terminology. If anything, it's, it's hard to keep it all straight. Uh, there are dozens of organizations and fellowship programs that support social entrepreneurs uh, in one way or another. You've got university curriculum, both at the undergraduate and graduate level. Uh, you know, dozens of global conferences. There are even youth programs that will support people in you know, great, uh, middle school and high school to start uh, ventures and provide a little bit of seed financing. So we've gone from social what to you know, you'll run into middle schoolers now, and if they don't already call themselves social entrepreneurs, they'll tell you that that's what I want to be when I grow up. So that's a condensed history, um, but, but what, are we, what have we learned? Um, we've learned a lot of things, and I, I wanted to just pick out a couple in closing. The first is that we can learn a lot from social entrepreneurs. And sometimes there's this misperception that social entrepreneurs are kind of entrepreneur light, uh, and they could use you know, lessons in hard reality from business. Uh, but what, when you look at the scope of the challenges that many of these people are taking on, and you, and you realize how few resources they're often working with, uh, you understand just how good they are at getting things done. Um, and the rest of us across sectors, whether it's in the public sector, whether it's in business, we should turn to them for guidance, especially as we think about advancing social change. The second is that social entrepreneurs are more interested in spreading ideas than just programs. Uh, and that's an important distinction. Um, you know, when you're spreading an idea, uh, you're thinking more than just building an organizational empire. You're thinking about how do I change mindsets? How do I change my field? Um, and this has implications for how we measure success, right? For one thing, we're talking about a totally different time frame. Social entrepreneurs are thinking about 5, 10, 20 years out. And there's a great story of, a, of a Ashoka fellow, David Green, who provides low-cost eye care uh, products all over the world. And he was on a panel and was, was asked, you know, what's your exit strategy, David? And he looked a little perplexed. And eventually he said, death is my exit strategy. <laughs> uh, so, you know, Ashoka fellows and social entrepreneurs, they're in it for the, the long haul. Um, and the other reason this is an important distinction is that uh, when you're trying to advance an idea, it's actually good when other people copy you and when they think that their idea is your idea. Right? That's a sign of traction. In fact, one of the ways that we talk about fellows su being successful is we look at how many of them have had their work independently replicated by others. Uh, the third is that social entrepreneurs represent a, a good bang for your buck. <laughs> um, you know, some people describe the work of Ashoka and, and similar organizations as social venture capital. Uh, and in a sense, they're right, because what we're trying to do is, is look at and invest in what the world needs, not what we have. Um, and, to, and do so through extraordinary people with highly effective and lean organizations. And so, of course, there's going to be some level of risk when you're involved in, 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 in a sort of kind of venture capital. Um, but we need to be more comfortable with risk, I think, especially in, in philanthropy. Um, you know, we, should, we should think twice before we tell people, no, you know, that vision is too bold, and what you're trying to do is too big. Uh, after all, you know, how many people told that to, to Martin Luther King? <laughs> but the sad thing is, if you're a social entrepreneur coming to a foundation today, you're more likely to be told that than if you're a business entrepreneur talking to a, a venture capitalist. And finally, you know, one of the advantages of, of working with Ashoka and being around this incredible alumni network of 3,000 Ashoka fellows in, in 70 countries is that you start to see patterns. Um, and not just patterns within fields, but patterns within the social entrepreneurs themselves. And how is it they became these incredible problem solvers and change makers? And one of the things we realized is that most of them caught this bug early on in life. Whether it was in high school and they were starting a recycling program or a school newspaper, there's this sort of empowering moment when they realize, you know, yeah, I can, I can do this. I can change things, even if it was small. Um, 
so as, as much as we rely on social entrepreneurs, like the ones you'll be hearing from later, um, you know, if what we really want in the world is for solutions to outrun problems and not vice versa, then we all have to play a role as change makers. Big, big roles, small roles. Um, and that starts with young people. Uh, so, so why not prioritize and spend more time focusing on these key skills that we know are central to effective change makers, like empathy, like teamwork, like leadership, especially in our educational institutions, uh, so that we can equip young people to walk into the world uh, ready to thrive and be that next generation of, of change makers. Uh, thank you very much. So 12 years ago, I was a corporate strategist at Compaq, but I served on the board of a charter school. And I saw these kids graduating and then ending up in dead-end jobs. And I thought, if I could only give them the opportunity to experience the professional world, the corporate world, during their senior year in high school, before they make this critical decision that will impact the rest of their life. Uh, and that thought was in my mind when September 11 happened. A week after September 11, I decided to quit my job, uh, or more like put my job on a hiatus, well that was 12 years ago. What I didn't know is that it would be so incredibly rewarding to do this kind of work, and so I'm committed for life now. People say that your destiny depends on which side of the track you were born into. But I have learned over the last 12 years that more important than which side of the track you were born into is which track your life is actually on. You see, we're all products of our environment and the expectations of those around us. And uh, I, I know this story because 12 years ago, I was a corporate strategist working in a big corporation. And as a good professional, I volunteered in those organizations that I felt passionate about. And I was on the board of directors of this charter school. And in the summer of 2001, I went to the graduation ceremony and I saw all these kids really happy about graduating. And so I went down to the floor, realized that many had, were first in their family to ever graduate from high school. And so I said, well, what are you going to do now? And one by one, they said the same thing. They said, well, I'm just going to continue my job. And I said, well, what do you do? And they said, I'm a cashier, I'm a hand packer, I'm in fast food. And I thought, okay, well, these jobs are good when you're in high school. But what happens three, four years later, once they leave any kind of formal education and they're stuck in these dead-end jobs, how in the world can they ever switch from that into a profession that allows them to live in the economic mainstream? They don't. They can't. And so here we go again, poverty for another generation. But for my corporate side, I knew that there could be a different path. As I looked into the eyes of these kids, I knew that they were full of potential. They just didn't know it. I suspected that if I could give them the training that they needed to provide value to a corporation and have the opportunity to work in a meaningful internship in a corporation during their senior year in high school, that perhaps that decision that they made at the end of high school that would affect the rest of their life, perhaps, would be different. And I thought, these kids grew up in communities where the expectation of entering the corporate world is not even close. They may even see a skyline from their school, but they're afraid of this world, right? They don't think they can enter or succeed. But if I took a kid just like this, just like this, and I placed them in that corporation, in that corporate environment, Perhaps he would realize that it is not this scary world. And perhaps it could be that simple that with just a year, I could get this kid to look at himself differently. So everything was good. I had the idea, but there was a sim simple problem. I had a pretty good job. I, had a, I was a corporate strategist. I, I had a good income, a good family, good, good everything. I couldn't leave that and start a nonprofit organization. So I needed a catalyst. And that catalyst for me was 9-11. So a week after September 11, 12 years ago, I decided to quit my job and, and start 
Genesis works. Now, contrary to what you know, others say about a social entrepreneur being there for life, I only told my wife I was going to do it for five years. <laughs> so I moved out of my nice corporate office, and, and I moved into um, a little donated office. And so that was the beginning of Genesis Works, and, and there, was, uh, there was two people in my office, and you see where the other one is at. So, so it was cozy. Um, and, and it was tough. It was th that, that first year was really, really tough. We, we almost didn't make it. Had 10 students. But, but we started to figure it out, and, and the next year we had 20 students. And I want to tell you about one in particular, Hector. Hector was a young man that, that was the oldest in his family and, and grew up in a community where he's, he talks about this. He said, the only options in life was to become a thug or a soldier. A thug or a soldier. And by thug, it meant, you know, drug dealing and things that he just wasn't that interested in. So he just wanted to go into the military. But he came into Genesis Works, and his internship was our very first client, which was Reliant. And at Reliant, Hector found that being an IT professional is not that hard, and that the people he was working with were, that, were, not, that smarter than he, were not smarter than he was. Okay? He started to see himself in that environment. And so when it came time to, to, to finish high school, he said, well, what if I go to college? And what if you did? And, and what if you, you, you go to Texas A&M? And, and it has an ROTC program. So if you want to go into the military, maybe you can do it as, as an officer. And so he got admitted into Texas A&M. And, and yet I, I remember uh, after the, his first semester, he called me and he said, Rafael, this is too hard. I can't do this. I'm going to drop out. He, he made a 1.7 GPA. I remember it well. <laughs> and I said, Hector, I mean, internally I was saying, Hector, the whole program is, is, <laughs> is on your shoulders. <laughs> but what I said was, was, was you know, Hector, you got, you got to just work harder. Now, Hector, what he thought about was the corporate world, and he thought about those people who had believed in him. And he had seen the light, he had seen, and he had felt what it felt like to be a professional. And so he learned that he just had to work harder. You know, he learned that he had to get the resources that he needed in order to, to succeed in college, and he did. A few years ago, he graduated from Texas A&M with a 3.0 GPA. And today he's a project manager working at Hewlett Packard. And I am very proud to say that this year he got elected to the board of directors of our Houston operation. But Hector talks about what he's proud of, uh, what, what he's the most proud. And, and it is not that he achieved success in college or that he achieved success in, in, in the corporate world, but the influence that he had on his younger sister and little brother. You know, his sister graduated from, from college, University of Houston, and his brother is now a junior at Texas A&M University. Hector speaks about how, for him, it was a big realization that college was a possibility. For his younger siblings, it was an obligation. Well, over the years we grew. And what started out with 10 students in Houston, Texas 12 years ago has spread. Now, this year, we had 1,000 students in our program in Houston, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Chicago, San Francisco. And we continue to grow at a rapid pace. What's interesting to see about this picture is that this is not a stock photo. These are actual students. These are students from Houston last year. You know, and you look at them, and they look like totally corporate professionals. right? Well, every one of them lives in one of the roughest neighborhoods in this city. And yet every one of them got to experience that they can succeed in a professional environment. And everyone got to demonstrate to the corporations that even though they don't look like the norm today, they are our future. And we are counting on them to occupy the jobs of the future. And they can do it. But folks, their life is not the only one that, have, that was changed. As a social entrepreneur, I got to tell you that my life has changed as well. My job is so unbelievably gratifying. And so for those of you in the audience, you know, I want to urge you to, to think about you know, what you're passionate, what you're passionate about, you know, and do something about it. Had I stayed in the corporate world, surely I would be more financially successful. But I wish I could tell you how rich 
my life is because I chose differently, because I became a social entrepreneur. Now, some of you may not want to quit your jobs. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. You can be involved in many ways. So I want to leave you with, with, the, with the first photograph that I started with. And when, I, when you looked at this picture, you probably saw the different tracks in life, right? Now I want you to look at the other side. And I want you to see this switch in the right-hand side of the picture. And I want you to think for a minute how much force it takes to move that switch. And when you do that with not a lot of force, a train that weighs thousands of tons will end up in a whole different city. That is the impact that you can have on human life, because human life is not different. Thank you very much. I had been a banker for about 20, 25 years and um, was ready to stay home with the kids, make a life change. I did that for a short while and realized, I realized, I think my family realized I needed to get back out there and do something else. I got involved with an organization that was working in rural Africa doing electrification and realized really how important it is to have something as simple as light and what an impact that makes in people's lives. And from there took it to, well, if this is so impactful, how do we make more of it? How do we help more people? And just started down this path one step at a time. And next thing you know, you're running a social organization, you know, <laughs> electrifying Africa. But it, it really was one step at a time. It's incredible to see that what you do affects other people. To be part of something that's larger than yourself is, I think, probably the best feeling in the world. I'm here tonight to do a little myth busting. We have heard some amazing things about social entrepreneurs, and it kind of puts the social entrepreneur up there on a pedestal, as if it's someone else or somebody else who's doing that amazing thing. What I know from the work that I do, which is working with women in Africa who are entrepreneurs, and what they don't know is that they are social entrepreneurs. We haven't told them that yet. But they are entrepreneurs building lives with, um, by building their businesses. Entrepreneurs are all of us. All of us have inside of us the ability to create something, create a business, create a living out of what we know, where we are, and with what we have. And that's basically what social entrepreneurship is. All you do is layer on it a level of, of service to others. And that is what builds the social entrepreneurship business, and it's what builds a successful business. And so from my point of view, it's, it's really one and the same. I work with women in rural Africa who live in places that don't have access to electricity. And what we do is we provide them with a business model that gives them a way to provide energy and light to their communities. What we're doing is we're teaching them business skills, and we're providing them with um, with the resources that they need to start a business that provides solar, that provides um, light and energy for, for charging phones, for providing um, light for the children to study, for providing clean cooking for their children and their families. In the process, they earn an income, and in the process, they bring um, energy to their communities. Solar Sister started out as, as an idea that came from an experience that I had when I was working in East Africa bringing uh, energy to rural electrification to communities. What I realized was that um, people, that women in the community, as we would come into a community, we were bringing solar light, we would show up with our batteries, we would show up with our solar panels and all of our wires. And um, all of the men of the community would come in and I can, if you show up in an empty field anywhere with a battery, I think men from all over the world will show up. It's, it's just <laughs> something that happens, something about batteries and men. But all of the women would be out back. They'd be cooking our dinners. They'd be fixing the, fixing the lunches, um, getting prepared for, for the event, the celebration of the fact that we'd be putting solar panels onto their school. And what I realized was they would never be part of the installation. They were never part of the program. We'd go back a couple years or six months or a year later to see how that solar panel was doing. And what we would find was that there would be six inches worth of dust on the panel. 
we'd find that the panel wasn't working anymore. And we would ask around, so what's happened? Everyone was so excited about the solar. Everyone was so excited about the light. Why did, why did this go wrong? And what we found out was that there was an issue between giving, giving away solar light and what ended up being um, the maintenance of that, that light and the maintenance of the program. And the issue was that when it came to taking maintenance and, and taking care of that light, that's, that was the woman's job. But because it was technology, because it was solar, because it was a panel, because it was on a roof, because it was a battery, the women had nothing to do with it. They were, they were not interested at all, or they were scared of it, or the men kept them away from it, or it was just not in their worldview of what to do. And so what needed to happen in order for solar to be something that could be applied in a rural community was that we needed to bridge this gap, a gap of technology and, and women. And so Solar Sister was formed really to kind of address that gap, to bring solar to the household level and to bring women and get them access to the solar at a very, very basic level. Solar technology is something that can bring energy and light into people's lives in places where there's no grid, there's no access to electricity. And by using the direct power of sunlight, it's a very distributable, distributable power. But because it's a technology, trying to reach it into the household, we had to bridge not only the last distribution, the last mile distribution gap, but also the gender gap of getting women comfortable with the technology. And so by having women be the salespeople, extending out to families both the, the awareness, the knowledge, and also the sales of this product, we're able to bring it out into the communities. Um, Solar Sister works in East Africa. We're working in Uganda and Tanzania and also in West Africa and Nigeria where this access to power is a problem. But the most important thing that I think happens is that the women who become the Solar Sister salespeople build up a, a, a self-confidence and ability to bring into their community something that changes lives and something that incredibly changes the lives of their families because as they're bringing income into their family, they're able to pay for the children's schools, they're able to pay for their health care, they're able to pay for, for better food for their families, they're able to invest in businesses that then take them further, as well as they are able to um, then lift up. Let me tell you a quick story about a woman named Teddy who was a tailor, and as she became a solar sister and um, became selling solar products for her communities, she also built a business in her home to, um, she was a tailor, and she used the light to power her business in the evening. So she no longer had to walk to the next town in order to um, rent a room, in order to do the sewing, so that when she came home at night, her children were there safe and sound. With the solar light, she was able to do her business from home and from that point on earn more money and invest in their school fees and take them to school. Um, solar Sister is a social enterprise based on women's ingenuity. What I know for a fact is that every woman that we work with has, has the ability to lift their lives out of their own problem solving and their own ability to reach out and change based on business and based on skills that they have inherent in them. Um, I know it's a universal, a universal capacity that I share with these women and that I share with you in order to be able to do, um, to do that, to lift up lives based on social enterprise. Thank you. I was 23, I quit my job as a stockbroker and started a children's art museum. And I ran that for nine years. And in the context of doing that, I was out in all these schools and noticed that recess had really changed. Like, I have a very high tolerance for chaos, but there's good chaos and there's bad chaos. And it just didn't feel good to me. And it occurred to me that if we just had one kind of like camp counselor-like person at the school caring about how recess felt and playing with the kids and and really norming empathy and teamwork and leadership and a culture of kindness, that you could probably change how it felt out there playing. 
You know, we all make choices about what we value and how we want to live our lives and who we want to be for our kids and our community. And the bigger question for me is not like, why would you choose to do this kind of work, but um, how could you choose not to pay attention to the work that needs to be done? 17 years ago, I was running a children's art museum in Oakland, California. And it, it's the kind of art museum where we went out into the schools and we did uh, artist residencies. So I'm out at a principal's office, and if you haven't been called into the principal's office lately, they look virtually the same as they did when we were all called in back then. And so I'm hanging out, and the, you know, the way it works is there's the outer office, and then there's the inner sanctum where the principal actually is. So I show up, and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting. I'm sitting in the chair, and it's, the principal's running late. She finally emerges from her office, and she just looks aggravated the way only an elementary school principal can. And she has these three little boys who are trailing behind her who have clearly just been chewed out within an inch of their lives, and they look miserable. She dismisses them to the school secretary. And she ushers me into her office. And mind you, I'm there to talk about this artist residency program. So I sit in the little chair, which is, always limits the power dynamic, you know. So I'm in the little chair, and she's in her principal chair. And she starts going on and on about the litany of reasons that recess is hell. And she's describing how her teachers find every reason under the sun to be anywhere other than the schoolyard at lunchtime, and how these three little boys aren't bad kids, but they're starting to see themselves as bad kids, and how she spends a chunk of time every day after recess dealing with the aftermath, and she's going on. She's working up a more and a head, bigger and bigger head of steam, and she's going on. She finally comes up for a breath, and she looks at me, and she says, can't you do something? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sitting there, and at the, actually, in the, at the moment, I believe I was like five months pregnant, and so I had some self-preservation skills sort of kicked in, and I was like, no, I can't do anything. But it got me thinking. And it got me thinking about how when I was growing up, and I grew up in Washington, D.C., um, that every day after school, I would go to the local playground. It was the park and rec. And there was this one park and rec guy named Clarence. And he would just make sure that whatever was going on, so I'm 49, too. So I'm before Title IX. I'm, I'm right after Title IX. But I'm before there was lots and lots of girls sports, like raising daughters now. My kids have had incredible boys and girls opportunities to play. But when I was growing up, I got to play with the boys. And Clarence did this thing where he didn't make a big political deal out of it, but he made sure I got in the game. And, and I, you know, luckily I was a good athlete. I could hold my own. But I remember just thinking, Clarence made sure that I, I got to play. So in that moment when Ms. Payton, the principal, was saying, can't you do something, it really did make me think, oh, you know, how big a deal would it be to, you know, have a new baby and make sure that everyone could play. <laughs> like, uh, well, you know, it was my first. I didn't know. Um, so uh, 17 years later, uh, PlayWorks operates. We have offices in 23 cities across the country. We're very happily here in Houston serving 19,000 kids every day. And uh, overall, nationally, we're serving almost 300,000 kids daily uh, and then also providing uh, programming to another 300,000 kids through training. And the model itself is both very simple and yet in the way that only uh, dealing with other humans can be also very complicated. Um, basically, we have in our direct service program these amazing young adults who we find and hire and then train until they beg for mercy. And we send them out into the schools, one per low-income public elementary school in our direct service. And they, in a lot of ways, function the way older kids in the neighborhood used to when we were kids. And they uh, teach kids how to do rock, paper, scissors. They basically explain, you know, things aren't going well. Michael, you and Jill switch sides to make the teams more even. They uh, teach them rules to games. And they're there. They're a presence. And they're paying attention. And they're engaging with the kids. And they're noticing when one kid maybe doesn't want to engage or when one kid's sort of acting in a way that needs a little extra loving guidance to really make sure that they're using their superpowers for good as opposed to using their superpowers for bad. And the impact is extraordinary. What we found, we completed a two-year randomized control trial last year uh, conducted by Mathematica Policy Research in Stanford. And while it might not seem at first blush that recess would be this incredible education reform intervention, what Mathematica and Stanford found was that at Playwork schools, teachers reported 43% less bullying at our schools than at non-Playwork schools. They found that kids felt safer and that with everything going on, you know how extraordinarily important it is for kids to feel safe, how fundamental that is to being able to learn. 
They found that kids were more vigorously physically active at Playwork schools. And frankly, if I was an entrepreneur and not a social entrepreneur, and I had invented a pill that could make us all more vigorously physically active, I would be the richest person in this room. <laughs> and then finally, they found that we actually, Playwork schools, we were recovering instructional time. And if you want to just go hardcore business, if you're going to monetize one thing in public education, it's instructional time. And on average at Playwork schools, we're recovering about 24 hours of instructional time per class over the course of the year. And if you monetize that, that's about a 200% return on the cost of the program. Mm. So all of this is who we are and what we do. But it's in the context, I think, of being a social entrepreneur, which 17 years ago when I started, I had no idea that's what I was doing. And, and I, I love to hear other social entrepreneurs talk about their path. Mine was um, a pretty unwitting one. I almost feel like, I've used the analogy before, but you know how you hear novelists talk sometimes about how they're writing the story and have all these grand plans for their protagonist, and then all of a sudden the character takes off doing something they had no intention for that character to do, and it takes on a life of its own. That has been my sort of entrepreneurial experience, that running Playworks has been this series of adventures where um, one opportunity, one adventure after another, one amazing human one new uh, chance to be in a different city has arisen, and we've followed those chances. We've fallen, followed those, those dreams. A and Ashoka and being involved with Ashoka has actually been an extraordinary door opportunity, uh, door opening opportunity for me as well. I became a fellow, we, we've been debating when I became a fellow, it's kind of a blur, but, but I think it was, two th we were, I was the second class of North American fellows. And becoming a fellow was really a springboard for me into meeting other fellows and talking with other people who were similarly deluded about the possibility of changing the world in a way that was extraordinarily reassuring, because it can be a little isolating to have this sort of myopic vision for where the future was going to look like. And being around other people who share equally crazy myopic visions, is re it's nice. It's, it makes you feel less nuts. <laughs> but most importantly, I think it was an incredible entree into a community of folks who uh, brought resources, who, um, who brought expertise, who brought a willingness to buy into the dream and, and, and share it and make it real. Um, among our ama most amazing funders, uh, the, the Jensen family in Dallas came on early on. They were part of making Ashoka happen in North America in the first place, and they became one of our big investors. Um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation heard about us because Bill Drayton, the founder of Ashoka, said that if there was one scalable model for addressing the physical inactivity crisis in America, it was Playworks and Jill Violet. And I got this fantasy phone call from a funder who was like, we want to see a, a controversial, uh, uh, provocative and aggressive business plan for national expansion. If you've ever done fundraising, funders never say aggressive or provocative. So I, <laughs> I totally, I totally questioned the veracity of the identity of the person on the phone, which not a great fundraising strategy, but it worked out okay. <laughs> and they invested in our growth. And so over the last uh, nine years, roughly, we've been scaling. And scaling a nonprofit is radically different from, from just launching one. Scaling brings with it all the vicissitudes of, and challenges of of really trying to figure out not only how do I do this really powerful thing, which I know how to do really well. I can get kids to play on any recess anywhere in the United States. But managing the different grown-ups in Houston as opposed to Boston or Durham, North Carolina or Portland, Oregon or Los Angeles or Salt Lake City or Milwaukee, our 23 cities, it's a big country. And it's really the grown up the kids, very, very similar. The grown-ups, really, really challenging and different, <laughs> you know? So that, that opportunity to learn about that and to scale it, having Ashoka and the other fellows as partners has been extraordinary and really made all the difference. I think the, the thought I wanted to close with, though, is that when we talk about what we do and the goals, right, we have this vision one day that every child in America will get to play. It's been extraordinarily important, especially as we've scaled, especially as with the 23 offices and you're managing remotely, to make sure that that focus is on how you focus on those outcomes and that vision, not just the raising and spending of money, not just the building the biggest possible playworks. What makes us a social entrepreneurial organization is that we're going for systems change. And I think when we ultimately get to that place of, of changing the world, changing it so that when we build schools, we're building them as places where kids really want to be, where they feel safe and engaged and like they have some modicum of control of the world around them, all these experiential things they learn at recess, 
then we will have met our goals. And it's a huge, um, hairy, audacious idea, but it's one that can fuel you and, and really help you get up in the morning. And, and ultimately, the, the big thing for me is that if we are, when we are able to achieve that, not only will we have made it possible for all those kids to play and for all of them to have learned to play well together so that they can be the next generation, being those citizens we so desperately need them to become, but we've become such a needed proof point that that kind of change is possible. And really in that, I think there's nothing that we need more than a reason to believe again that we can trust one another, that we can rely on each other, that, that this, this contract that we've made with each other as citizens of this amazing country is something that we as the grown-ups are gonna really uphold and make sure that this generation of kids we recognize that there's nobody else coming and that it's on us to make sure that we do right, just as the generation before did by, by us. So thank you all so very much. You know, when I look at the kids coming out of college today, I, I sort of, I'm jealous. I wish I'd thought about the world that many of them do. You know, I think they're much more conscious about the world that was left to them by the previous generation. And so the, the impetus for change is a lot harder. And if you look at sort of the disenfranchised, that bottom of the pyramid, those three billion people, it's not getting better. The world's getting more populated, but so are the, the poor. So we haven't solved that. And I think more and more people are understanding that systemic change comes a lot through entrepreneurship. If I can accelerate the change and the systemic change they're doing by with just the skills that I learned as, you know, as an executive, that's pretty meaningful. Three years ago, I gave up my uh, corporate CEO jobs that I had and decided to do something else, which is uh, coach and advise uh, executives. But uh, I realized uh, that I've been doing that for about five years with my work with Ashoka. I'm a member of Ashoka Support Network. Uh, what that is, we're a group of about 300 CEOs and executives who are available to these entrepreneurs as a resource. So. I'm in the logistics business. If one of them has a supply chain thing they need to figure out, they might call me. Or in general, we help with any possible thing uh, that we as business people take for granted. How to run effective meetings, how to put together a business plan, how to think, how do I scale and grow my team? How do I deal with talent management issues? How do I create a deck for an investor? These are things that as executives we do all the time. And what I found is that it is a lot more rewarding to work with a social entrepreneur who is changing a system, who's part of changing the world, and that by helping them with the skills that I learned as a CEO and as a leader, I can be part of changing that world. Because the other thing I figured out is I haven't had a good idea like these people. I'd like to be a social entrepreneur, but I haven't figured it out. So I do the second best thing, which is I help them. And by helping them, I can also be a change maker. And at Ashoka, we really believe that all of us have to be change makers. There's three billion plus disenfranchised poor people under the poverty line that are not making it. And as our world goes from five billion to seven billion people, that number's not getting smaller, it just continues to grow. And that's a world we don't want to live in. And while these social entrepreneurs do some amazing work and create these systemic changes to this social plight, we as business leaders influence a lot of people in our work. And so one of the things I learned when I started working with Ashoka is that I actually wasn't giving, I was receiving. And I was becoming a better leader, a leader with empathy, a leader that understands a little bit better that, first of all, the employees that are joining our organizations, they're going to have five jobs in the first 20 years of their career easily. So I, as a leader, better figure out what it is that floats their boat to keep them working as talent in my organization. And to do that, I have to be a lot more empathetic than you know, when I started in 1984. Um, also, the concept of empathy applies to how we care about the communities we do business with as business leaders, and it certainly cares if, uh, it certainly matters if we think around the concept of this triple bottom line that we all have to serve, profit, people, and planet. If we really want you know, to leave our kids with a, with a better world, while these social entrepreneurs are sort of dealing with the incubation of the next generation, we as leaders manage thousands of people and we have a lot of influence. And so uh, by joining Ashoka, not only do we, I become a better leader, uh, but also I think I can apply those skills that I've learned to people uh, like these three people you heard about today. And by doing that, maybe I can give them a leg up, help them scale faster, avoid some of the mistakes they've made. And they're great leaders in their own right, 
but um, they need uh, all the support they can get, and Ashoka does that through various ways, and one of them is this Ashoka support network. I'm going to talk to you about a couple of things, about my story about that, and the pictures I'm showing you are me uh, working with Vera Cordeiro. She is a uh, social entrepreneur in Brazil, and she has a program that takes single mothers from the slums. The picture here is Rosinha. It's a slum. It's one square kilometer. It has 120,000 people living in it. And uh, she takes women that have uh, severely critically ill children. They're single mothers. And she runs them to a two-year program and takes them from absolute misery to self-sustainability. They come out of this two-year program. They've had all the legal help, psychiatric help, medical help for their kids and their families. They've been trained a profession. And two years later, they come out uh, self-sufficient. And Vera and her team have been doing this for a long time. And uh, I worked, started working with Vera about five years ago. And then when I left my corporate world and did my own thing, uh, now I go down every two months and I work with Vera and their, her team on everything you can imagine about helping her grow her business. She's, done, she's helped 15,000 families, and our goal is for, for that to grow to 150,000 in the next five years. So you can imagine an entrepreneur like this, how do they scale their business? And the, the kinds of help that we can give as business people to do that. So the pictures you'll see are all from work in Brazil. Um, the Ashoka Support Network is basically a global community of, of leaders that are available to these entrepreneurs. Like I said, there's about 300 of us. We're all over the place, but we're sort of geographically agnostic. If a social entrepreneur needs help with some supply chain modeling, they'll call me in Miami. On the other hand, you know, I'll do work in Brazil or New York, uh, wherever, wherever the, the, the entrepreneurs need us. Um, you know, one of the things obviously we do is we share, you know, our skills and, and the network that we provide, um, you know, to those entrepreneurs. We, we've been around for a long time. We've got a network of CEOs and other people we do business with, and that network can be extremely valuable for, for those entrepreneurs. Um, and like I said, um, if we do our job right, maybe we can make them be a little bit better leaders a little faster uh, than on their own, although they will remind me that they know their job pretty well. Um, so our job is not to change what they do, it's to accelerate and to really be a support structure. And as an uh, Ashoka support network uh, executive, you become part of a global community of, of like people that are, that are influencing change all around the world. Uh, and you know, I really encourage you, if you're interested in this world, to, to think about that. And if you think that you know, one person can't make a difference. You know, the Dalai Lama said, if you really believe that one small thing can't make a difference, tell that to a mosquito. And I, I've learned that I can make a difference. And I've also learned that Ashoka and the fellows I work with have made a big difference in my life. Um, and, you know, if you're interested in, in doing that, if you can't be a social entrepreneur, you can be the second best thing with me. Um, you know, there's plenty of ways to engage with social entrepreneurs. Um, one is, you know, the coaching of, of the, of the uh, the, the entrepreneurs themselves, um, we started a concept of advisory boards. So it used to be that we'd have a one-to-one -one relationship. You know, a fellow would call me up and I'd help them. And we've now created a concept of boards. So I'll bring three or four other CEOs on a board with me and we create a really exponential experience for these, for these fellows. So, you know, four CEOs, all from different walks of life. Maybe one will be an internet expert, another one will be a supply chain expert. And by doing that, we're really creating a thought partnership resource for these fellows that hasn't existed before. Um, and there's lots of other Ashoka initiatives. You know, I, I get involved in two. One is working with the fellows, and the other one is I talk a lot uh, with CEOs about empathy and, and introducing them to the concept of social entrepreneurship and, and trying to waken that spirit that's dormant in, in all of us about wanting to be part of changing the world to be a better place. My story started in 2008. And I started just by donating two or three hours a month of my time uh, to Ashoka Fellows. You know, I was living in Singapore, running a business, and schedule a Skype call at 2 in the morning with somebody that wanted to figure out how to move eyeglasses from China to Durban, South Africa, so, that, South Africa, so they could distribute them. And, you know, hopefully my advice at 2 in the morning was, was valuable. Uh, uh, probably wasn't that valuable at the time. Um, but. Um, and then I, I belong to an organization called YPO, which is an organization of CEOs around the world. And um, we introduced YPO to Ashoka. And in my chapter in Miami, three years later, half of our entire chapter is involved in social entrepreneurship. Our kids have interned with fellows, and it's really become part of our DNA. And you know, for those of us lucky enough to, to have good positions, it's pretty easy to write a check and feel good about a check. But I will tell you, 
to give your time and know that the, the things that we do every day as business people can really add this kind of value and be a part of, of making a, a systemic change working with, with folks like this is much, much more rewarding and frankly, more necessary, I think. Um, we created uh, the advisory board. I talked to you about that. And then, in, then I started getting more involved in mentoring. I used to do those two to three hours. And my journey is not typical. But some of us in the Ashoka network, uh, we really got the bug. And it was really life changing for me. Um, I changed my career and, and you know, started working for myself. But it also gave me the opportunity to decide that I wanted to spend 50% of my time on social entrepreneurship. And that was a luxury I had, and I'm, I'm really blessed that I was able to do that. But what I did is I went deep, and I, I support about five fellows pretty deeply. Uh, and I'm still available to everyone else, but you know, Vera and I have been working together for five years. I feel like I'm part of that family, and I'm part of the plans that they're putting together, and, and, and a real member of that team. And that's just incredibly rewarding. Uh, we've launched, a, we have a global Ashoka ASN Summit where all of us ASNs get together and we meet with the fellows and we set the agenda of how, we can, how can we be more impactful for these fellows, you know, what are they looking for? Um, and out of that came, you know, doing what I do today. I travel all around the world talking to leaders and executives about this opportunity to marry what we do in our regular business life with the passion to be impactful and uh, that those aren't two separate worlds. And when you engage in work like this, you find that you bring that in and you bring that social entrepreneurship into the organizations that you lead. And all of a sudden you're really impacting your employees and your communities in this change making. And it's really revolutionary. So, you know, I thank these fellows every day for what I've learned and, and my ability to, to talk to folks like yourselves uh, about this because it, it, it adds a lot more purpose. I don't define myself as having been the CEO of DHL or the CEO of Agility. I define myself today by having the skills to pass those on to people who are doing incredibly meaning, meaningful, life-changing work. And that's a blessing that, that I've had. Um, and I think all of us here have that opportunity. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll just leave you with the thought that, you know, you can spend a couple of hours supporting these folks or you can uh, decide to, to do as much as you want. But uh, thank you for your time. I'm Michael Haggerty, Senior Producer for Houston Matters on Houston Public Radio. And we've got some questions for the forum, the our MIT forum participants. I'm going to start with uh, first a familiar face, the General Manager of Houston Public Media, Lisa Shoemate. Thank you so much, Michael. And thank you for your inspiring speeches. What advice do you have for organizations that are reinventing themselves for the, for the future as opposed to pure startups? Well, I'll take a pass. Um, you know, I think one thing is don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. I mean, I think we stand, as social entrepreneurs, we stand on the backs of foundations and institutions in this country that have done just extraordinary work. And so really hold on to what you do really, really well. and then. Be willing to experiment and make mistakes and try some pilot programs. Um, this, we were talking earlier about um, sort of a lean startup approach where some of the best work that's happening in nonprofits is happening from the sort of the, the grand old damn institutions and giving their employees and, and as donors being open to them trying things and making mistakes but ultimately becoming the best possible companies that can be, they just happen to be nonprofit companies. Can I add something to that? There's, you know, there's a lot of big business doing really great work uh, in, in, in this area. Um, you know, if, you, if you think about this concept of social entrepreneurship, of, of getting the groundswell going within big business, and this whole concept of shared value, of trying to figure out how the services or products we create in business can not only generate financial profit, but can also serve to solve social needs. You know, I have a friend in, in Colombia who run, is one of the oldest Colombian families and they do floor tiles and plumbing. But he worked with a social entrepreneur and they created a special floor tile, a low cost, to, to for the first time ever create, you know, flooring in, in homes that have only had dirt floors in the mountains and hired uh, women to, as a sales force, gave them a microfinance product. And now, you know, thousands of homes have better living conditions. And guess what? He's selling into, into a market that he's not only creating social good, but he's creating, you know, selling into a market that was, was, was not a market before. 
So every company can figure out their shared value. You know, sometimes it's through opening up to new markets of, 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 of you know, the underserved. Other times it's through supporting uh, social entrepreneurs who are doing really good work. At Genesis Works, uh, we, uh, we recognize that uh, students, even though they're not normally thought of as being able to provide value in a corporation, they actually were. A and if they could provide value, why couldn't we charge corporations for those services that students were providing? So because of uh, that income that we receive from corporations for the work that students actually do, we're able to fund 75% of the organization's budget. And so my advice to organizations come forward is, is to realize that, 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 that philanthropy is, 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 you know, is, is, is challenging, it's always been challenging. And so to the extent that they can start uh, earn income models that allows them the ability to fund their programs, uh, the programs will become more scalable uh, and more sustainable long term. All right, next question. Well, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanted to thank all of you. You're extremely inspiring, and I, I'm so grateful to have been here to hear you. But I was sitting there thinking that ideas don't come to fruition easily, but each one of you sitting up here made the change from going about your everyday business or occupation or running a corporation and woke up with an incredible idea. The majority of them were the antithesis of what you did for a living and you made it happen. What advice would you give to people that, you know, you can actually have an idea that is pretty far-fetched, not easily sellable, come to fruition? and actually just work. I would say the very best ideas I ever had were completely illogical. <laughs> if, you look at, if you look at them on paper and you put up your pros and cons and you, you make your list and you decide, am I gonna go forward with this or not? The, the decision would be no. You rip up that piece of paper, you toss it out and you realize you follow your heart and if you have the commitment to make it work, it will work. Um, it's, you will fail, but that doesn't matter because what will happen is you'll get up again and you'll try again, you'll try it differently, you'll work harder, you'll do it better, you'll come up with a different idea that's slightly going to go down a different path, but you'll end up accomplishing something that you will never imagine that you even set out to possibly have the potential to accomplish. You'll end up in a place that you can never imagine you were gonna end up if you follow that dream, if you follow that heart, if you follow that spark that you have, that it's like, wow, you have this idea, it's crazy. Maybe it's not gonna happen, but you know what? Don't listen to logic sometimes, put that aside. And this comes from somebody who is completely logical. So that's my advice. And you know, it, it takes the pressure off a little bit to not uh, expect all of us to have new, brilliant, world-changing ideas, right? I mean, so the way that I've been able to get involved in this world is, is, is through an organization that, that supports uh, social entrepreneurs and that helps advance their work uh, in various ways. And, and a lot of my colleagues uh, may go on to, to start their own thing, but sometimes we put that much pressure that it has to be something <laughs> brand new that I have to do. But as we can see here, just, just you know, on this panel, there's, there's, there's so many fascinating people doing fascinating things uh, that we can all find ways to plug into that uh, and to support it. That, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, being crazy alone is a lot harder. When you're a member of Ashoka, you're, you're, you're in a family of crazy people all doing this. And you know, I think what Raphael told me earlier, he said, you know, when you do something that you believe in and that's right, good things will happen. I want to thank all of you for taking time to be a part of this discussion. Thank you. Thank you.